Now you've, you've been involved in some applications and, and, and some business type things yourselves. I, I was going to ask you about uh, Homeplug AV, uh, what, what, uh, what that does, because that seemed like an interesting product to me. Well, that was a fascinating project I did about a decade ago, and I got approached by Sanyu, who was my customer there, who were in um, a consortium to produce um, a, a spec and, in fact, a chip. Um, which this consortium would then put in devices to communicate at 155 megabits over domestic power lines. Mm. And this is a truly fascinating engineering problem. Um, this chip is now available in many devices that, for example, are wireless LAN extenders. So you can plug a device into your, um, your Wi-Fi hub at home yeah. and you can have a second hub um, upstairs or in your garden shed or whatever so that you've got a second Wi-Fi access point. Yeah. They're used a lot in uh, big houses, small hotels, b and small businesses and so on. And the noise and the complexity of the domestic mains environment, particularly in multi-tenanted buildings in large cities, mm. makes this a really difficult engineering problem. And so we needed some security not just to keep the bad guys in their grey vans out, but also to enable users to separate their use from their neighbours. Yeah. And our problem use case, uh, the one that we thought about hardest, is what if you have got a 20-storey tower block in Seoul with four apartments on each floor, so you've got 80 families in a tower block. Mm -hmm. That's typical accommodation in Seoul. And you go down the market one morning and um, you buy yourself a, a new device that will plug into your home plug um, AV network. Um, let's say, for example, it's a pair of speakers that will communicate over the um, domestic power line with your, with your sound system. Mm -hmm. When you plug that in and turn them on, how do you see to it that they mate with your sound system yeah. and not with Mrs. Park across the corridor? Absolutely. Now, at the same time, we wanted to be able to provide um, serious security for people who need it for people who, for example, are patent attorneys who work at home and might be the target mm. of serious attacks. Mm. And there what you can do is you can simply have an AES key on the back of the plug and you press the secure button and the only thing that you can then do to recruit a new device is to tap in the appropriate a AES key right. and verify it. But from the point of view of the guy living in the, in the tower block in Korea, mm. that's completely overkill. And so we designed a protocol whereby you just repeatedly press buttons at either end until it works. Reset, try again. And the thing that shocked many of my fellow cryptographers about this is how it works it sends a key in the clear. Right. It says, hi, um, if you hear this key, it's a good key for communicating with me, I'm Fred. Now, of course, that's instant sudden death if the NSA has a grey van outside, they then own you. Yes. But for most people, that's not the threat model. No, no. And um, even if there is eventually a confidentiality threat, it's very rare that it will be there during the one second or so that you're initializing the system. Mm. And so we had long um, debates about how you could possibly do a, a just work initialization of a system. And we came to the conclusion that even if we made the chip cost four times as much money by putting in public key cryptography, it wouldn't actually help you because there are still middle person attacks that would work in any case. Yes. And similar arguments have been had since then um, about how do you do key setup on a number of other um, wireless and, and ad hoc communication systems. Mm. So what would you call that? Security through being genuinely sensible about the risks? Well, what we actually call it is the resurrecting duckling protocol. Okay. Uh, because the original idea, which was thought up by Frank Stiano and me, um, is inspired by nature in that when um, a duck head egg hatches and the duckling comes out, the first thing that moves and quacks is mummy, mm. right? And, mm. and various biologists have tried this experiment yes. of being around when the duck hatches and it fixates on them. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, there it are prints on them, didn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. There, there, have, there have been people who have got geese imprint on them and mm. then have the geese flying behind them in their motorized hang glider. Yes, yeah. So the idea is that when a, a newborn device comes out of the shrink ramp, it imprints on the first thing that talks its protocol to yes. it. And the first thing that hands it a key basically owns it. Yeah. Okay. Now, for that to work, you also have to have a mechanism whereby you can cause the duckling to die and be resurrected. Right. So you have got a button that says, commit suicide now, <laughs> bam. And the duckling comes out the egg again and says, where's mummy, where's mummy? 
I like that, that's good. No, um, <laughs> the, the, the original idea we had was thinking about um, how you would met a thermometer in a hospital to a, a, a doctor's smartphone, mm. or PDA, because they didn't have smartphones then. But yes. That was the idea. And the first application that we had of it was in the TacoSmart um, uh, protocol. Uh, this was something that was thought up in 97, 98. Uh, for replacing wax paper chart tachographs with digital ones mm. and one of the things that we wanted to do was to encrypt the communications from the gearbox sensor in the trunk to the dashboard unit right. and given the logistical difficulties of managing fleets of tachographs in fleets of trucks across um, lots of member states of the European Union with different suppliers about the only thing that you could practically make work um, was a resurrecting duckling protocol in mm -hmm. which the gearbox sensor in fact is the mother duck and the dashboard unit is the duckling. Okay. So when you reset the dashboard unit it looks for a gearbox sensor and says mummy and mates with it. Mm. I like the idea. Now you, you were saying to me earlier actually that a, a lot of the ideas you, you've got from other disciplines and it just put me in mind of this idea that a lot of the most interesting stuff now happens at the interfaces between different disciplines. Well absolutely. I think I, I've been so lucky in my career because um, I've always been working of security of X, where X is a new application that comes along, where they mm. hadn't thought of security yet. Mm. And security and Y, where Y is a discipline. And I've been stealing ideas from signal processing, from economics, from psychology, as was appropriate to solve a problem. Yeah. So um, unlike many um, scientists who you know, are technology driven, you know, they do their PhD on formal methods, for example. So they go out and look for more and more problems that they can solve with formal methods. Yes. Uh, I'm driven by the problems. I'm fascinated when I get an email from somebody who says, help, I've been ripped off and I don't understand it. And if I don't understand it either, yeah. then that's a problem to go it's out and look at. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Now, um, I, I wanted to ask you about who's been an inspirational role model for you in, in, in your work and in your career in general. Well, I suppose the main influence on me was my thesis advisor, the, the late Roger Needham, um, who was, you know, one of the greats in UK computer science. He um, ran the computer lab at Cambridge for many years. Um, he learned to program on the EDSAC, the world's first proper computer, and his contributions included the Needham-Schroeder protocol, which became Kerberos, um, and the Burroughs Abadi Needham logic, which was the first serious um, attempt to do formal verification of cryptographic protocols. Okay. And, and that's what first got me um, engaged with him mm. um, in that um, you know, I had a payment system problem and he showed me the BAN logic paper and um, I managed to apply it to my problem and um, a year or so later I um, was his research student. Mm. Lovely. Um, and so Roger and I had a lot of good times um, tackling new problems, uh, many of them around the world of cryptographic protocols. Um, another influence was David Wheeler, who was Roger's advisor. Mm -hmm. And David was the world's first programmer because he was Morris Wilkes' research student when the EDSAC was turned on, and so he had to figure out how to make it work. Okay. And David was an algorithms guy. He uh, was interested in cryptography and number theory and things like that. And he influenced my early interest in uh, cryptography, you know, during and just after my PhD when I ended up working on hash functions and block ciphers and things like that. And a third influence, I think, was Hal Varian. Mm -hmm. Hal was the guy with whom I sparked the idea of starting to look at information security economics as a way forward as systems started to globalise. Um, Hall was a professor of economics at Berkeley at the time. He's now Google's chief economist. Yeah. And um, he basically got me um, to start thinking of problems in our field through the eyes of someone who does microeconomics. Mm. Okay. Well, that's some interesting examples. Now, we hope that our interview with you today will spark some interest in, in some other folks. So if someone's thinking, I'd like to pursue a similar align to yourself, what advice would you give them? Well, I have followed a fairly non-standard career because I started as a mathematician and I went out and worked in real industry for a dozen years or so and came back to do a computer science PhD. Mm. Um, most researchers nowadays um, go to university at age 18 and never leave. 
I think that's actually a shame, mm. and I think it's important to get real-world experience, yeah. even if it just means um, consulting for industry, even if it just means spending all your sabbatical time working for Google or Microsoft or Facebook or a startup or whatever, mm. rather than just going to another university. Because our business, the business of computer science, exists because the computer industry exists. Yeah. And the science usually follows along behind the applications. People are faced with a real world problem and they figure out some way of solving it. And then people with some relevant theory come along and find some way to tinker with it and solve it a bit better. Right. And eventually, perhaps 10 or 15 years later, you know, you get the full academic rigor is turned on it and a lot of people prove lots of theorems and figure out optimality and all the rest of it. Yeah. But if you've got it in your heart to be a pioneer, you know, if you're, if you're the Lewis and Clark type rather than the land lawyer type that comes 50 years later, then you've got to be out where the frontier is. Yeah. And that means where people are building interesting new applications or where people are building interesting new technology mm. or at the crossroads between them. Okay, that's interesting. Last thing I'd like to ask you, could you give us a little bit of insight on what you're going to talk about in the, in the lecture in March? I really don't have any idea what I'll be talking about in March um, because, hey, what I've been doing has changed so much year by year over the past 20 years. <laughs> well, in that but case, we, we can wet up everybody's appetite that, that, that information is to come. That's yes, well, well, we still have to invent that. They say that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Okay. And uh, that should really be the motto of people in our trade. Absolutely. Good. Well, look, thanks so much for speaking to us. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thanks.